Hello, all. Well, you know, when you order something online and you're expecting it to be here because, you know, they sent you a notification saying that it was supposed to be here today and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and it's not arriving yet, hasn't arrived yet. So you go check the tracking just to find out that it's still sitting several states away. Tonight was supposed to be the beginning of my 160th scale perfect grade unicorn build. However, that model kit arrived in the States about two days ago from Japan, from Tokyo, and is still sitting in Chicago. Don't know why it's still sitting in Chicago, but it's still sitting in Chicago. Thankfully, I had some backups. So, I've got a couple models to build. Don't know if we'll get through all of them today, or both of them. They are lighter models, not as intensive as the perfect grades. They're just high grades, so kind of your base level model kits. But both of them are kind of nostalgic for me in a little bit of ways. The first one we're going to start with is the one that you see there on screen. That is Gundam Heavy Arms. And it is from the Wing Gundam series, or Gundam Wing, which is actually the first series of Gundam that I actually saw. So it's got a little bit of nostalgia for me because it kind of introduced me to the world of Gundam. It is not my favorite. And nor will I really say that I am a major fan of the Gundam series. I like some of them. But I don't know the world as well as some of people out there probably do. I enjoy the mech designs and kind of Bandai's engineering that goes into these kits because they're quite impressive, even for these small kits like this. The amount of detail that they do is very, very nice. So we'll move this. And these are the runners for it. There's a few different runners for this one. This one's a little more pieces than a lot of the other ones that are out there. Um, there are some of these high grade kits that are really, really light that don't have a lot to them. Um, the granddaddy of them, all the high grade original RX-78-2 Gundam is one of them that doesn't have a lot of pieces, but has a few. Um, these do also, also do not have as much articulation as some of the other more advanced kits do. But these still have a lot of nice detail and a lot of nice posability, considering that... These are all snap together kits with absolutely no glue needed at all. So let's get building. Um, now, if I were doing an instructional video or a build review video, I would go through and pull all these parts off before I did each section based on the instructions. But since this is not that, we'll just do everything live. There's 
there's a lot of nice color separation on this. Now, if you are looking at buying some of these kits, there are a few things to keep in mind. Um, this series in particular, the Wing Gundam series, has, oh, several different forms for each one of them that's in it. Depending on which it's from, whether it's from the actual anime series or if it's from the OVA, which is their their kind of mini series that they did. Um, kind of showcase that they called Endless Waltz. And I'm already dropping pieces. That's okay. In which they went and redid some of the designs of some of the, the mobile suits. Key among them were that they changed probably the heaviest was probably the actual Wing Gundam, which they changed to a uh, more, I guess you could call it aesthetically pleasing with the the uh, actual like bird-like wings. It's actually one of my favorite designs because of that. But it's a really nice looking kit, especially once you get into some of the higher grade versions of it. Because they put a lot of articulation into the wings themselves. That is the point I need. Now, the other thing to keep in mind when it comes to a lot of these kits is like anything that's popular and of good quality, there are a lot of copycats out there. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a lot in the Bandai kits, but there's one main one that I know of, and that's Daibon. And Daibon even went so far as to just rearrange the name of Bandai and slight name changes to the actual mobile suits to make them intellectually different. But they are just ripoffs of Bandai's kits, which is very, very sad. Considering Bandai did a lot on these kits and their injection molding process is absolutely incredible. I keep grabbing the wrong piece. I keep skipping steps. There we go. Clean up these sprue marks a little bit. And kind of one of the fun parts about a snap together kit like this and the way Bandai does them is you can have a really good looking kit without ever having to paint it. 
because you have most of the color separation as part of it, which is actually really, really nice. Now, it's not going to be, say, as good as some of the others out there, potentially, just because there's not as much kind of real-world color separation in them because there's less parts. But they do have most of the color separation, and if you really want to get into it, you can do a lot as far as customizing them. Now we get to that piece. Now, hopefully, within the next week or so, I'll have the perfect grade to be able to do it. Because that's the one I really, really want to do. That was the one I was really excited for. But once I, was, once I saw that it wasn't going to be here, I figured I might as well have a backup plan, just in case. And thankfully, there are some of these cheaper, lower grade kits that you can pick up at various places. Yep, that looks good. I need the front of the chest. His pectoral guns. some of this and really with just a hobby knife and a pair of nippers you can get these looking pretty clean if you just remove most of the flashing And then something as simple as just kind of taking a light wash of paint with a brush and just water down your paint really good. You can do a dark wash on these with like a black or a brown paint and make these look really good because it'll fall, kind of settle into a lot of these crevices and bring out a lot of the detail in it. And that's kind of the fun of these, is you can go as deep or as light as you really want to go.
Now, this particular version of Heavy Arms is not necessarily my favorite. Um, the color combination that they did on it was not one that I particularly cared for. The red and orange. Um, it just seemed really off for a quote military mobile suit, but you know, it was kind of a product of its time, so. And they had a lot of odd colors on the the mobile suits and the mechs during kind of the time when this particular one came out. Now, most of these kits have very simple, straightforward um, sprue marks or nub marks where the sprue actually meets the piece. So they're pretty easy to kind of clean up. You also have less to worry about with scraping them. But because there are some of which have like mechy plating on them, which is a metal plating that they, well, a metal look plating that they do. And those ones you got to be a little more careful with because you'll scratch and ding them up. Oop. There was a bubble in that injection molding. I hope everybody else's week has been going good. Mine personally has been very busy. That, I will say, is probably one of the biggest dangers of doing these models is some of these small pieces. If you drop them, they can be difficult to find, which is probably a good thing that this one's in bright colors, because I suspect I'll probably be doing that a lot. I need to clean that one up a little bit better. It's not going to fit right.
You know what? I'm going to take... I'm going to zoom in real quick so that... Oh, yeah, Sydney. Yours has been rough. Well, it'll get better, hopefully. Take. There we go. Okay, camera focus. There we go. Now you might be able to see a little bit better what's going on. This is a smaller kit. There we go. But man, my fingers don't want to work today. There we go. And almost completed with the chest. You know what part? Ah, PC4. Speaking of, this little thing, these are called polycaps. And they're a softer material, almost more rubber like that they do on these on the the high grade and master grade kits that allow it to fit together nicely and have a little bit more move maneuverability it's what they use for a lot of the ball joints but still be stiff enough over time that it'll still hold poses And chest done. Kind of show you some of the little gimmicks that they do on some of these. Like his chest opens up to reveal the Gatling guns inside. And the Gundam's name, after all, is Heavy Arms. And he is probably the most decked out with firearms of any of the Gundam's Really, ever. <laughs> Most of the other Gundams are more known for using one or two guns and then swords or beam sabers. You know, the... Kind of like a lightsaber type weapon. Okay, set that off to the side because that is now done. And what is the next part? 
Oh, we're moving on to the head. The head should be fun. So we need that piece there. And this I'd like to kind of showcase real quick, because this is kind of part of Bandai's thing is this is a single runner done in a single injection molding die. And they know exactly precisely how much of each color plastic to run in each section so that these meld together but don't overrun so that you have like the yellow bleeding into your red parts as well as their gating all kind of facilitates that too which is i find absolutely amazing That is going to be a white part, I'm pretty sure. The face, is that a white part? Or is it gray on this one? Where is my D runner? Oh, no, it is white. Right there. Right? D1, 11. Oh, there it is. It's staring me right in the face. Get it in the face. And I will need this piece here, looks like. And this piece here. You know what? I think... I think we need some music. So, I think... Let's get some... Let's get some background music going. And let's adjust the level down a little bit. There we go. Hopefully that's coming through well. Yeah, there we go. I like that. Okay, now let's get this head assembled. So, some of the worst small parts are these little face mask pieces. But these, I don't know if my camera will actually focus on that. Maybe, come on. You can do it. You can do it. Might have to manually do it. <laughs> see if I can get it to focus. There we go. You can see the lines in there, a nice dark wash on that would really bring out those lines. So I might do that off stream in between. And then just kind of, when I start the next build, kind of just do a quick show of some of the stuff you can do. I kind of bring out some of the interesting features on these. Why did my camera reset? Let's try that again. That's better. Okay.
Oh. And I'm seeing in the manual that there's denotions for some of these stickers on here. almost forgot that is one of these things with these particular models that they do not a big fan of them honestly but they are what they are the easiest way to get these off I found is to use a pair of tweezers I don't know how well that'll pick up on here, but. Those stickers are part of the reason I think I like some of the higher quality model kits a little bit better. Because they actually, um, they include typically like dry transfer decals and a lot more clear parts for like the eyes, which I think look better than these. These don't look too bad. Dry transfers also tend to stick better than these stickers tend to. Um, I will say if you can, once you have a lot of these parts assembled, if you do a nice clear coat on them, those stickers will stay in place a lot better than they will just on their own. Another, nope, no sticker there, looks like. And this piece sandwiches over top. Okay. We have a head, partially. Still a few more pieces to go on there. Which are these little side pieces. I guess they're probably antennas even though I think according to the the actual storyline of Gundam the main antenna is actually the V fin which will go on here towards the end of the building the head There we go, clicks right onto there. Clean this one up a little bit. Hopefully. Like I said, I'll probably be dropping stuff a lot. Especially since my fingers don't seem to want to work today. But that's starting to come together and start to, starting to look a little bit more like a head. And there it is. This piece right here is the front. And there is a sticker that goes on this one. A little green round one.
which if I could had all the paints that I need this would look a lot better if I could paint it but I don't have all the right colors for this press that on there just a little bit more so kind of press it in gently though because these will damage really easily because they're a foil sticker and so you'll lose some of that reflective shiny color if you poke at it too much with anything sharp which these particular tweezers are probably not the best for this but it's what I've got right now, so. And here is the V-fin I was talking about. This is a trademark of pretty much every Gundam ever made. Is this V-fin. That. Is now starting to look more like an actual Japanese robo. This pops right on here and has a little bit of movement, not great compared to some of the others out there. Can move forward. Has actually two kind of points of articulation there in the neck, kind of. Because it actually pivots forward and back on a ball joint that's actually in the body. And then the other one doesn't move up and down, but allows it to pivot side to side. So there's that ball joint there that goes in the body that actually allows it to tilt to look up and down somewhat anyways. Now on to the arms. And I need E116 and E117. Or, no, A17, which is this one here. Must be the left arm. And. E116, that's gonna be over here. Over here. There we go. One of these days I'll invest in some of those little racks that they make for holding your sprues. Or I'll just 3D print some. Maybe I'll design some and 3D print some. I think that's a good idea. And then, and yep, this goes right in here like so, looks like. If I can get it lined up, there we go. Just like that. Then a nineteen. Add up some. There we go. And a few little cover pieces that go on here. And where are they? A3. Mm -hmm. 
But as I was saying, I this series is one that I didn't get into because the original series was came out before I was born, if I remember right. And later series, some of them were okay, some of them not so much. But this particular one, oh gosh darn it, I forgot a piece, because again I'm getting distracted, that's okay. Thankfully, because they are snapped together, I can easily take them apart and fix that. As long as I hadn't gotten too far on the assembly anyways. I forgot a poly cap. That would be helpful for when I go to actually put it on the rest of it once it's assembled. There we go. Wow. But this year, the Gundam series in general There are some somewhat, I guess, problematic things in some of the stories, but of the Gundam series, the one that I kind of fell in love with the most over time has actually been the Iron-Blooded Orphan series. And that's a lot to do with the storytelling in it. And it was, you know, it was a little more gritty than some of the others. There were still some kind of problematic things in it. If you really wanted to dig into it <laughs> but overall I think it was one of the best Gundam series that they ever made But it technically, if you look at it compared to the rest of the Gundam series, it was outside of the, the normal story. It was not as the, as the main Gundam stories have been called part of the Universal Century. Um, Iron-Blooded Orphans was outside of that. It was, they gave basically the director free reign in essence, to create a story. And this is a little hinge piece. I can get it together here. There we go. To create their own story within kind of the Gundam franchise. That wasn't tied to the rest of it, which allowed a lot more freedom with storytelling. He didn't have to stay true to the core story of the Earth Federation forces and the Principality of Xeon. And could tell a story about basically war orphans in essence children who fought for what they felt they needed to get out of the life that they were forced into because they were orphans.
and were used as menial labor and viewed as less than human. This looks like it's probably the inner frame of the arm, at least the upper arm. And while I haven't, I never really got terribly into the actual series of Gundam, except for a handful of series, I got into the model building because, as I said kind of at the beginning, I fell in love with the design that they have for their, their mechs. The very humanoid movement and design and I absolutely love the ingenuity and the, the precision and the engineering of their kits to do what they kind of wanted them to do. And it's taken them a lot of years to get to the point where they are in their manufacturing process, but they have done amazing things with injection molding that other companies have tried to mimic, but I don't think a lot of them have been able to do as much as what Bandai has done. And when I started to fall into a lot of my kind of mental health issues, dealing with my OCD and my intrusive thoughts, and a lot of that kind of stuff, depression, these type of things kind of gave me a way to just kind of sit down and relax and kind of get away from a lot of my own, my mind's own pitfalls. Nope, that is the whole arm without the armor. That's interesting. I was not expecting it to be that. Oh, and it's double jointed. So it's got a joint here and here. So it actually gives it a, a larger range of motion for more posability. But I, these were, became, along with video games, kind of became an escape, a way to kind of refocus myself, re, you know, get away from whatever my brain was telling me and just kind of relax a little bit. And to this day, stuff like this has always been something that I will use to kind of almost like a, a mechanical therapy, I guess you could almost say, to kind of step out from mindsets that are not the healthiest and as kind of a reminder of you can do things you are you know what you're doing is is important what you're doing is more than what you think and You're not, that your mind is lying to you. I guess is the best way to put it. 
because when you're dealing with intrusive thoughts, it lies to you a lot. It tells you things that aren't true a lot. It tells you that, you know, your significant other's cheating on you. It tells you that you're not good enough, that you can't do the things that you want to do. And things like this always acted as a good reminder to me that even if you're not doing things at the level or the quality that maybe somebody else is doing, you still can. You can still do things. You can still do what you need to do. You can still do things that you enjoy. And especially once kind of a lot of the depression stuff hit, that was a big thing for me, was reminding myself that I can do those things, that it's okay to take time for myself and not always be there and kind of step away and take care of myself. Something I... probably struggled with the most. I'm just going to cut these both off because I'll need them both. This actually being gentle with myself. But for a long time, I didn't think mental health was important. I was raised in an environment that told me that I didn't, that I was the problem, that the way I was acting was a problem, that the things I felt weren't valid. And you know, that's not a healthy thing to live in. And wow, that's actually got a fair amount of movement because of that double elbow. But, and I think one of the hardest things that I had to learn was, especially when it came to dealing with, not necessarily myself, but my friends who also suffered from various types of mental health struggles, was that even if what they're feeling or what their brain's telling them isn't true. It doesn't make that feeling any less valid and should be addressed as such. Not that they're wrong, but that their mind is just lying to them. Some neat little gimmicks on this. Got the little flip out blade under the arm. But that they should be that just because they're feeling that way doesn't make it correct. But that they're feeling it and because they're feeling it, it is still an important thing to address and, you know, address potentially why it's not an accurate feeling.
but not to belittle it. Um, I know a lot of people like to throw out those phrases, you know, when it comes to mental health, like just, you know, well, Sydney, you know what I'm talking about, like toxic positivity, where people will throw out phrases that they think, you know, are helpful, you know, like, you know, there's, you know, just because you think you have it bad, somebody else always has it worse, or, you know, at least you're not this, or at least you're not that. Those type of things, they, they come from a place of wanting to help in most cases, but actually aren't helpful because we all have struggles. We all have pain. We all have things that we all deal with in different ways. And we react to things differently because, you know, humans are like that. We don't all act exactly the same. And I think that's important to realize that we are different. We all have our own struggles. And just because, yes, someone somewhere else may be experiencing a pain that is potentially worse in a specific sense doesn't mean that your pain is any less valid. And it doesn't mean that your pain should be handled any less and should be approached as something that should be addressed, should be, you know, pointedly looked at and addressed as an actual issue, not dismissively through something that somebody thinks is helpful, but actually isn't. Um, I had a girlfriend at one point who, you know, she had a lot of things that she dealt with on a daily basis and a lot of things that she would feel that weren't true when it came to, you know, dealing with other people. But it was still a matter of looking at those things and, you know, pointing out, you know, that those things aren't necessarily, a, that those things may not be true and, you know, potentially showing some of the reasons why those feelings or ideas are incorrect but still showing that those feelings are still important still valid and it's okay to have those feelings even if they are incorrect but that they you know should be addressed as such not blown off and ignored and I personally think that it falls very much under one of the cores of of Bushido respect because if you respect someone then you should be willing to address any issues that they have and address 
the things that they feel even if you know that they are not true. But another part of that is addressing them in a way that's not condescending. Because I know that's something I've dealt with a lot is people going, well, in essence, basically saying that you're stupid for feeling that way. And because you're incorrect in your feeling that you're just stupid, that you're dumb or you're too emotional. That's when I used to get a lot, was you're too emotional. And we're humans, we have emotions. Sometimes those emotions get kind of thrown all over the place. And we don't always react emotionally the way that we necessarily should, or in a way that is necessarily healthy. But because we are feeling them and we are human and we all make mistakes in the way we feel, in the way we act, Those type of things should still be considered valid and, you know, should be approached with kindness. Kind of one of those little core things that I learned in the many years that I have worked retail. I have worked retail longer than I really wish I had. But when it comes to dealing with certain customers, it's there are those out there, those customers out there who are going to always be problems. But there are also a lot of times where A customer is reacting in a specific way not necessarily out of actual anger or spite or maybe there's something else going on that you don't know about that may be causing them to act that way towards you. It took Honestly, it took several years of food service experience to put me in a mindset where, okay, I'm not actually the problem and to not take everything personally. It's a very difficult thing to do. And there are times when, you know, even now, I still don't always react the best way to certain people and certain situations. But we're all works in progress. <laughs> Just like this model. And because I was yapping and talking and all of that stuff, 
I put the part of this together wrong, which might explain why this piece wasn't fitting the way it should. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Getting distracted. And now, can I get it back apart? Come on. There we go. Or did I? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I put the upper part on right. Did I? Nope. I put the other, the upper part on wrong. There we go. Now, maybe it'll actually fit together properly. There we go. There we go. And where's the other hand? Now. right in there look at that he's about halfway done now did I miss anything specific other than what I've already corrected <laughs> um, no stickers on those parts so we're good okay Looks like next up are legs, starting with the feet. Ah, and they're having you build these in tandem. So each one. So we start with, should be, those are for later on on the legs. Set that up there. Those are should be B runners. Yep, that's B1 and E1. So I need E1 and I need E2. There we go. Oh nope, that's B2. E2. There it is. <laughs> I need E2. E2 four, which is right here. And the nice thing is, is you can, they can do stuff like building the feet together at the same time because the feet are completely and totally interchangeable. They're symmetrical parts, whereas the legs themselves necessarily aren't. And I need poly caps for this one. Ah, these big guys here.
And one of these days, hopefully, I will get myself a better camera to work with. And hopefully maybe two cameras so that, you know, then maybe, you know, you guys can see the looks of quizzical questioning as I'm doing some of these steps and I mess something up. <laughs> now, there is a streamer out there that I do watch from time to time and he's another Gundam builder. Only, I don't think I'd ever be able to do as good as I have become at building most Gundams and how easily I can recognize most parts, I don't think I could really do what he does, which is he will a lot of times take and build Gundam kits with no instructions solely on what his chat is telling him. And I honestly don't think I could do that. I honestly think I might go a little insane trying to do that, if I'm completely honest. Ah, there, see, there's the red parts. Because I think even then, not having instructions, I think I would still kind of be driven insane with somebody try, somebody telling me what I need to do as far as steps go. Because I'm just like in video games, I don't like backseaters who try and tell you how to play a game because I like to play things the way I play them and discover things on my own. And I think my chat trying to tell me what step to do and I think I would just about probably go insane and probably have to end the stream early. Oh, this looks like this toe might actually pivot. We'll see once we get it all together. Which is actually kind of a rare feature on a on a uh, high grade kit like this. It's not often that you have ones that have toes that actually pivot. But kind of nice because they kind of, if it does pivot, that actually gives you a little bit more posability for once it's on display on your shelf. Which is actually kind of a neat thing about these. I will take in the ones that I have kind of set up, I will go through every once in a while and change up how they're posed just because. And let's see. Oh, yep. Yeah. And that that does pivot. So you could actually kind of do a little bit more dynamic poses probably makes them a little more stable with some of those poses too because there's it's a nice large surface area on there too but the are kind of that type of toe articulation well not as as advanced or fancy as some of the the real grade or pro or perfect grade kits that's actually kind of a nice little feature Now, let 
we'll keep him there so we can kind of so you guys can actually kind of see the progress. Now, Heavy Arms is probably, I think, is the on, only the second kit I've ever built from the Wing Gundam series. And... The first one, and probably the first Gundam model I ever built, was actually the actual Wing Gundam Zero, which is the one from... Endless Waltz, which is the one with the big bird-like feathery wings. Just because at the time I had never, I hadn't seen Endless Waltz. I had just seen the little bits of the series of Wing Gundam and found it kind of interesting. And then I saw that model kit, I think at, I think at Kmart when they were actually still existed. And they were fairly cheap. I think I only paid like Fifteen dollars for it at the time. Nowadays, you pay an arm and a leg for most of these model kits due to shipping costs and a lot of that that goes into it. For instance, the perfect grade that I have coming direct from Japan, which is still sitting in Chicago, which still kind of irritates me. But it's okay, it'll get here eventually. Um, was the, the base price of the model is about $150. Because its size, its intricacy, the amount of parts, its engineering. But shipping was almost as much as the model itself. And so. If anybody ever wants to order model kits like this, you know, if you want to get them direct from Japan, um, hlj.com or it's Hobby Link Japan, they are a great source for them. But keep in mind that if you do order them, you typically want to plan to have about double whatever the price is for what you're ordering for shipping. It's not usually going to be that much, depending on what level of shipping you want to do and how fast you want it to get to you. Or at least get to whatever country you live in. Um, but it's a good rule of thumb, I think, for making sure you have enough for everything. Because unfortunately, they, and I get it, um, they're not the type that really has like a, um, a buy so much, get free shipping type of thing. Cause I mean, that's expensive shipping and you know, it's, you know, at least as far as I've heard from other people, it is quality shipping and shipping that will keep your order intact. At least I would hope it would. That is the hope. We'll see once all said and done, but, you know... It was fairly fast considering I it wasn't that long ago that I placed that particular order. And it's already in Chicago. But you know 
things are expensive these days. And there's unfortunately a lot of things that play into it. Demand on freight services, fuel prices, supplies, everything kind of plays into that. And unfortunately, it is where we are at in the current day and age. And at least right now, I don't see it getting much better. I hope things will start to normalize now, but We shall see how things actually go. But I'm hoping to make things like this, Gundam builds. Hopefully I can start working with some of the um, other makers out there who do a lot of like resin prop kits and stuff. I'm hoping to be able to start working with them again and maybe get some of their stuff to feature on here as well. I really hope so. That would be enjoyable and fun. Because there's some really, really talented makers out there who do some incredible cast resin kits from movie props, video game props. And I think those would be really, really fun to feature. And just kind of build out, put together on stream. This kit so far is actually going together quite nicely. That's kind of what I thought. This one I didn't think was going to take me very long. Although we'll probably wrap up for a break here shortly. There's some little nub marks I don't want on there. at it. Mm, you know, 
I use the nippers for doing these, but you don't necessarily even actually need them. Just helpful in a lot of cases. Especially if you want it to fit fairly well together. Because you, a lot of these, you can snap off of these sprues fairly easily. But you'll run into other problems doing that. You'll stress the plastic. You'll have some ugly stress marks on certain pieces. That'll just kind of look odd and out of place once it's assembled. And I need a polycap for this, one of these guys here. in there. What do we got now? next? Let's see if I can maybe get this so where I can actually kind of see my instructions a little better. on the leg. here. Yes. E1. 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 There we go. Oh, there it is. E11. And this, the little rocket pod face, which I don't know if I can get there, maybe. Come on, camera. You can do it. You can do it. Focus on me. Focus on what I'm trying to show you. There we go. Block out everything else. Maybe that'll work. There we go. Those I would potentially take and use a, uh, a silver or some other color and just paint all the little circles to make him kind of stand out a little bit more. And that's another nice thing about these model kits. If you decide you ever want to change anything on them, because they are just snap fit kits, you can just pop them apart and do any after customization that you think of or want to do. Hmm. 
Ooh, I scratched up the front of that. Oh well. Now the little joint armor that they have. This guy here. pieces. Ah, these ones here. Six and five. And apparently there's little stickers that are supposed to go on these. I'm going to take a look at those and see if I actually want to do them. When I first started this, I'm like, oh yeah, I'll just use all the stickers and just show them that. But I don't know if I actually want to do that. Yep, those are not going to stay on there. I'm not even going to bother with those. Those are something I'll, I can paint at a later date. Maybe do some of that and then show it off on the next Gundam build stream. Just to give people an idea of what some of these things can look like when you're when you really want to, to do a lot with them. Because over in Japan, and there's a few places here in the US that do it too, but there are some really, really incredible um, competitions that they do. Hmm, that seems a little unstable, but whatever. It works, I suppose. Um, of Gundam builds, and they do both like your standard kits like this here. unmodified and then custom builds where you know you take an existing kit and then customize it whether it's that means like adding like battle damage or things like that to it or taking in you know using kits multiple kits with different parts that are compatible and will fit together because there's a lot of them that will because you know most of them use very similar mechanics so it doesn't take a whole lot to modify them to work together and actually there's some really neat ones out there that people have done um, i know there's a guy here in the u.s that will do Gundam builds and specifically does these absolutely amazing like dioramas of a battlefield of them. Um, and I just, I find it very interesting to see what a lot of these guys come up with for different things to do with these um, as a matter of fact one of the dioramas he did was of a former battlefield one that's been sitting for you know decades where the he did a whole bunch of like um, um Oh, what is it called? I am trying to remember what the stuff's called because I have not used it. Flocking, that's what it is. 
because uh, I haven't used flocking in like years. Um, it was a common thing when I was doing car models to use flocking for for carpeting in cars to make them look like actual carpet. But he used like a green flocking like what a lot of model train builders use to make it look like grass and moss that was growing on it. Um, because it had been sitting there for so long. Yeah, it was very, very neat to see how he kind of built up this world where this battlefield had been untouched by a man for so long that it was kind of like the the um like the idea of the earth starting to reclaim everything and started to grow over it It's just, it's really impressive to see the, the creativity that a lot of the creators out there have. And maybe one day I'll, I'll actually do stuff like that. But right now I don't have the, the space for it. And buying all the supplies for it can get kind of pricey. First, fully empty sprue. And I think with that, we're going to finish up this part of the leg real quick. And then I think we're going to take a quick break. So we've gone a little bit longer than I normally go for breaks. So All right. So that's done. So we'll pick up on the rest of this here in a little bit because we're getting close to the end of this kit. Very close. So we're going to take a quick break here. And we'll be back here in a minute. Um, give everybody a chance to go to the bathroom, get a drink, all that fun stuff. All the things we need to do regularly. So, see you in a few.
Okay, back at it. Took the liberty of snipping off a few quick parts here real quick, just to make this a little bit easier. For this last little bit, because we've already seen all those parts once before already. So, don't really need to show all of them getting snipped off again. Almost at a fully completed leg again. Which means there's not a whole lot left to this kit. Most of the intensive stuff is already done here. Yeah. This piece. That's another thing. Just thinking about it now. Is that Bandai does a lot of work in making sure things are kind of keyed so that you can really only put them on a certain way. If my camera would focus. Come on. And unfortunately, this camera, I can't very easily focus on my own. There we go. So, you know, parts go together nicely and you can't really too much. There are a few where I've seen where you can put things in the wrong spot, but for the most part, they're really well crafted and designed. so that you can't really put them in the wrong spot. For the most part, anyways. Okay. Now, Let's take a look here, because there's the last little bit there. Now for the waste section. This piece here. And Is there any more pieces on this one? Yes, right there.
That fits in there. Oh, that's probably for the legs so that you can kind of pivot them a little bit for poses. out there in chat but potentially just kind of a all curious curiosity question if anybody out there has watched any of the Gundam series and if they have any favorites or if like me they're more of a enjoy the design of certain things but maybe not necessarily a huge fan of the actual show looks like this is probably the back skirt armor it looks like there is a sticker that's supposed to be on here Oh, yep, yeah, that one right there. there that sticker actually is cut pretty well it sits pretty well in those creases however because it is a sticker the adhesive on these don't always hold that well and you'll feel you'll see them peeling up after time My one complaint with these type of models is you'll see that a lot. Um, Bandai has done in the past with some of their higher grade kits, uh, actual water slide decals for them. And I know there's a couple companies out there who produce aftermarket ones. I've never done any of the water slides for any of the the Bandai kits just because I find water slide decals can be kind of a bit of a pain I enjoy the way that they usually end up looking once they're all set in place but they uh aren't my favorite to deal with. Grab the front armor here. Which this is something you'll notice on these lower grade kits. This front armor is typically just one solid piece. It sits right here in front of each leg. But on the higher grade kits, each one of these is actually a separate piece. And this one actually looks like you could potentially, um, with a little bit of modification, you could potentially make this a separated piece where each one acts independently without a whole lot of trouble.
I'll have to look at the parts once I have them more completed to see if that's actually a possibility, because now I'm kind of curious if I could actually do that with it. So I think that might be, that would be potentially a fairly easy little customization you could do on it. And give it a, just a tad bit more realism. And that is sprue number two that is now empty. Not very many left at this point. Mostly our color separated parts here in the yellow, red, and kind of dark blue. Some of the gray parts, some of the gray runners still have some pieces on them. And that's about it. Oh yeah, I bet you you could potentially. Now this is kind of what I'm looking at here when it comes to that is, so potentially, I'm half tempted to try it here on stream because it's not, it wouldn't be that hard to experiment with and see, but potentially might be able to take that piece there and my camera would focus on it. There we go. And make that so that they move independently of each other. So as a matter of fact, we're gonna do that right now. I'm gonna take my hobby knife We're going to snip that right here. I am curious. Those will actually sit in there well enough without popping out. And I think there's enough grip in that ball joint that it will. Oh, yep, because it has another piece that fits in around it. So yes, those work perfectly separated. So that just adds that one little extra little bit so that they can move independently. Just gives it that little bit extra, which is actually kind of nice. And side skirts and the main body will be done. There's only one piece left on this runner and it's the little shield for the gun. And the last two poly caps. And heavy arms will be complete. these guys in, lift them all the way up, pop this leg in, this leg in, fold those down, set those down, yeah, 
and that goes in there. Boop, head popped off. There we go. And now, the main body is assembled. And even without the little extras, which we'll assemble here in a second, this actually has some interesting little gimmicks um, that are accurate to this show. So he has his shoulder mounted missile launchers with doors that close up on them. His leg mounted rocket pots which I will probably go in at some point and do some color separation painting on those to make those stand out a little bit more. And then here in the chest, his dual Vulcan cannons. Which I'm trying to remember exactly how these work because in most of the Gundams, your pilot is actually in this chest cavity. And I don't remember if they changed that in the Heavy Arms model so he's somewhere else because of those chain guns. Not completely sure, honestly. Okay, so now let's do the what's next? The backpack? Backpack, yep. So that's this guy here. And this guy here. just sandwiches together nothing fancy really on this and then we've got a couple of little thrusters that pop on there Now these are parts that in the past I have gone in and glued in place just for sanity's sake because these are items that sometimes will fall out easily. These are just a press fit. That plugs right into the back there. for the, just the last little bit. And that's this guy here. Ooh, and that's one you gotta be careful of. That little nub there. That little nub right there is right on one of the sprues. And if you're not careful, <laughs> I almost cut that off. That would not have been good because that would have made it hard to attach other parts. And I've actually made that mistake before of cutting stuff off like that.
and runner number three completely done We are wrapping up towards the end of this build. I can't wait to do some more of these. I really enjoy doing this. Always been, as I was saying early, earlier, this type of stuff has always been very therapeutic for me. I think it's probably one of the reasons I also used to love and enjoy working on cars. There's the end of his, the barrels of his big Gatling gun. that and you can actually kind of turn that and position it however you kind of want it to look um, this is something that I would potentially take and use just a little bit of silver paint and a dry brush and just hit some of these high spots and surfaces on here to give it a little bit of worn look so it almost gives it a more of a metallic feel or a little like it's been beaten up and used and scratched. The handle. So you can actually hold it. Little shield piece. Pops onto the side here. And so. Another runner done. And yet another runner fully empty. I wonder if I'll actually have any leftover. Looks like uh, there's some leftover pieces from this kit. And then... Ah, okay, so this is a piece that could be used on the side here. So that he can carry it on the back. Or it actually goes in here and actually fits over his arm like so. Well, you pop off the hand and then this fits over the arm, and this handle can be used by his other hand to hold it, like so. Mm -hmm. 
or you can make him, you know, a little more epic. You know, wielding it one-handed without the support. And that is that. That is one completed Heavy Arms Gundam build. Now, if I could only get my hands on the Endless Waltz version of this, because it has even more armaments than this thing does. But let's take a quick look. So we have looks like extra foot pieces and leg pieces from this set. And then we have a whole bunch of other hands that we can use for different poses. Other gripping hands, other uh, just open hands, which gives you, you know, different display options. Um, when they first started doing the real grade and perfect grades versions of these guys, they specifically made hands with jointed fingers and when they first started doing those that's all they included was just the articulating fingers ones but later on with the newer versions they started doing both the articulated fingers so you could pose the fingers however you wanted to and then also the static fixed pose hands which honestly is a lot better if you're actually wanting to display them because those those articulating fingers while neat and very interesting on their design they cause all kinds of issues on their own as a matter of fact this here this is the hand from a 160th scale Gundam Exia model that I have. And this is the articulating finger. So each one of these fingers moves and can be articulated just like an actual finger. Fingertip, middle knuckle, and the knuckle of the hand. The thumb has, just like our thumb, has this joint here and this joint here. So that's exactly how it moves. The problem with these is because these are joints on a plastic model, each one of these joints can separate and they will not stay off in the poses you put them in all the time. So they tend to fall apart fairly easily, which is a little annoying. So the fixed posed hands are actually kind of nice for that. But the things you could do with these ones for posing and display are really neat. Sadly, they're not always the most stable. But you will probably see more of this type of thing once I get my 160th scale 
Unicorn Gundam. But that'll be postponed for now, sadly. But soon, soon we'll have it. And that'll probably be a multi-stream build because those, the, the perfect grades, they're quite a bit to put together. So, but, this was kind of a fun little interim build. One that I've never built before. There are several that I've built multiple times, including the Wing Gundam, Wing Gundam Zero, um, Gundam Barbatos from the Iron-Blooded Orphan series, as well as a few others. Um, Sasabi, uh, several of the, the Zeon Zakus from the original series. Um, and some of those I could probably put together without the instructions at this point, but this is kind of a fun one to do. Now, I'm kind of curious, what kind of range of motion do we have on this one for posability? Well, if you had it, if I had a stand, you could actually kind of put him in a, a jumping pose because the toes will actually tilt up so that you can actually set him standing on something with one foot forward, one foot back. But they also tilt down a little bit too. Ankle movement is actually quite a bit because it's this little ankle armor piece isn't tied directly to the foot like in a lot of the other models. So that actually works fairly well to give that actually a fair amount of motion. And this is kind of moves independently of everything else too, which is actually kind of nice. legs again have that double joint where it pivots here and in here giving you quite a bit of motion in that leg which means you could actually do like a like a kneeling type pose with them kind of sitting on your sitting on the shelf like that. Um, you know, you can even bring this forward a little bit more. And this leg back a little bit. So this is actually closer together for a more natural kneeling pose. With the little modification I did there with this these front skirts and separating them, it means that those actually will act independently. If you didn't if you don't separate those, then these would move in unison together. Legs also have a full pivot in them. And both pivot here, but also have a piece. Move this arm out of the way. We'll move that out of the way. Where they actually move forward and back so that you can kind of move his legs depending on how you've got him kind of posed so he's better stability. A net neck joint, I'm not super impressed with. It doesn't seem to want to hold very well. I think that's probably my only complaint so far with this kit. 
but if that doesn't want to hold very well. But because most everything on here is done either as a pivot joint or a ball and socket, there's actually quite a bit of posability and range. Because, you know, he can move his arms all the way up. Not quite, not too far in front of his chest with the way these shoulders are pivoted, but not too bad. I'd say overall, good kind of master grade kit. Kind of the quality I have come to expect from these lower kits. Decent posability, de ver good detail, good color separation, but nowhere near the, the, the more expensive ones. But still really neat and decent looking without even have to, having to paint them. That's one of my favorite things is you don't necessarily have to paint these because everything's molded in color. Everything is kind of what it should be. While not everything is going to be color perfect, if you really wanted to, you could go in and you could do all the, the color painting. There are additional stickers that I could put on here because um, these little... Let's see if I can get it to show up. There we go. Those little chevron pieces on the chest, those are supposed to be blue. There are stickers you can put on them um, or you could, you know, you could easily, fairly easily paint those. They're raised up. So they're pretty easy to kind of separate out for either hand brushing or, you know, any other type of painting. Um, there's stickers that technically go on these side skirts as well that you could put on there. Um, I tend to not use very many of Bandai stickers because while they are, I'll use some of them depending if I think they're going to be fairly easy. Oftentimes I'll do them or if it's a a color that I don't necessarily have or can't get very easily, then I'll use them um, and then potentially I'll remove them and repaint it once I do have the colors. And these are, these stickers are cut fairly well. If I can get it to focus, there we go. They're cut fairly well as you can see and they have little cuts in them for like any surfaces that you need to go over but even then they're not always perfect and the adhesive on them oftentimes isn't great and you'll they'll start to come off over time unless you seal them and then if you do seal them with a lot of these if they're a metallic sticker even with the best clear coats Oftentimes you will lose a lot of that shine and reflectiveness in a metallic. And so you're better off if you can painting it in a metallic paint. And then using a good high quality clear coat to go over it, depending on whether you want it to be a gloss or a matte finish. Um, but Overall, I think this was a, a fun little build and it makes me even more excited to get my 
next big one and start building that on stream because that's going to be a lot more intricate and a lot more detailed. And we actually finished this one up a little before I normally end. So I guess with that, we're going to wrap up, I guess, because not quite enough time left to start in on the other smaller one I've got. So we'll have to save that for another stream. Who knows? Maybe they'll hang on to it in Chicago for another week. I doubt that, but you never know. So I guess this is the end of the stream and I will see everybody later. And I hope everybody has a wonderful Friday tomorrow. And I hope the weekend is a wonderful weekend. I know mine will be okay. <laughs> I work, so yeah, it is what it is. But I hope everybody is taking care of themselves in whatever ways that that means, mentally, physically, all of the above. And have a wonderful night, and I will see you guys on Tuesday.